In 1939, the Pennsylvania Railroad unleashed a 140-foot locomotive so immense it could barely fit its own tracks, a machine born to break speed records, yet sabotaged by its own power. Subscribe for the untold stories behind the rise and abrupt fall of these lost legends and discover how dreams of dominance collided with reality. America's railroads kept chasing bigger, faster, and stranger engines, but some creations, like the S1 and its rivals, vanished almost overnight. Why were the most ambitious steam locomotives, the engines too powerful, built only to disappear? Crowds flooded the transportation zone at the 1939 New York World's Fair, drawn by a spectacle of steel and chrome unlike anything before. The Pennsylvania Railroad's S1, stretching nearly 140 feet from coupler to coupler, towered above the pavilion on a set of rollers, its streamlined shell gleaming under the lights. Designed by Raymond Lowy, the S1 was not just a locomotive, it was a statement. Its six 446 wheel arrangement stood alone in American railroading, a rigid frame so long it outclassed every rival. Pennsylvania Railroad publicity promised a new era of speed and power, boasting that the S1 could run the equivalent of 50,000 miles on those rollers. For millions of visitors, the engine became a symbol of limitless progress. Yet behind the spectacle, the S1's sheer scale came at a cost. Pennsylvania Railroad engineering circulars quietly limited its route to only the straightest, strongest stretches of track. Standard turntables were too short, curves were too tight, and bridges along much of the system simply could not bear the weight. The design that stunned the public at the fair would soon reveal its limits in the real world as ambition raced ahead of what the infrastructure could support. Coal trains thundered up the eastern slopes of the Appalachians behind engines built for raw force. On the Norfolk and Western, the Y6B class reigned as the last word in articulated steam with a 2882 wheel arrangement. These giants delivered from 1948 to 1952 were engineered for one purpose, to move the heaviest loads over the steepest grades with a boiler pressure of 300 pounds per square inch and cylinders measuring 30 by 32 inches, the Y6B could deliver up to 170,000 pounds of tractive effort with its booster engaged. Those numbers eclipsed most of its contemporaries. Unlike the earlier Y6A, of which number 2156 survives today, every Y6B was ultimately lost to the torch. The power of these machines was matched only by their fate. In the early 1960s, as diesels closed in, a handful of rail fans rallied to save number 2174 from the scrap line. Their letters and petitions fell on deaf ears. The railroad, focused on modernization, saw no place for yesterday's muscle. As the last Y6B was cut up, the chance to preserve the pinnacle of Norfolk and Western steam vanished leaving only photographs, roster notes, and memories of mountain thunder that would never return. In 1914, the Baldwin Locomotive Works set out to redefine the boundaries of steam power with a machine that seemed to defy logic. The Triplex, built for the Erie Railroad, stretched the very idea of what a locomotive could be. Instead of the usual two sets of driving wheels, Baldwin's engineers devised a 28882 wheel arrangement, three engine units with the last set of cylinders driving the tender wheels. On paper, the triplex promised a staggering 160,000 pounds of tractive effort, enough to pull the heaviest coal trains up the steepest grades. Early brochures called it unstoppable. But the reality was less forgiving. Steam had to travel through more than 100 feet of piping before reaching the rear tender cylinders, and by the time it arrived, pressure had dropped so low that the back engine starved for power. Test reports from the de Gaulier Library detail how, at speed, the triplex could deliver only about half its theoretical force. Crews struggled with complex controls and maintenance headaches. The engine's immense weight and length strained tracks and switches, and any hope of widespread use faded quickly. Within a few years, all three triplexes were scrapped. 
the lesson was clear. The pursuit of brute strength, unchecked by practical limits, could turn promise into disappointment. Baldwin's radical experiment stands as an early warning. Sometimes more is simply not better when it comes to steam. Southern Pacific's Motive Power Department faced a landscape unlike any other. The AC-9 class, delivered in 1939 from Lima, was their answer. 122884 Yellowstones, each weighing more than 338 tons, before even coupling to a tender. Unlike Southern Pacific's famous cab forwards, these engines kept their cabs at the rear, following a conventional layout. Their job was to muscle heavy freight through the heat and grades of the southwest, where coal was scarce and tunnels were few. Partial streamlining hinted at modernity, but the real innovation came a few years later when all 12 engines were converted from coal to oil. The change was not just about fuel, it meant cleaner running in desert winds, less time spent on ash pits, and fewer headaches for crews on long drags through New Mexico and Texas. For a brief window, the AC-9 engines thrived, their immense tractive effort pushing wartime freight across the southern system. Their scale and power answered a specific need at a specific moment, yet special aceization came with a cost. The engines' sheer size restricted them to select routes, and by the early 1950s, diesel electrics had taken over. Every AC-9 was scrapped by 1952, their service ended not by mechanical failure, but by the relentless push for efficiency and flexibility on a changing railroad. Steel quotas, labor shortages, and wartime urgency shaped every locomotive that rolled from American factories in the early 1940s. Under the watchful eye of the War Production Board, railroads like the Chesapeake and Ohio and the Pennsylvania Railroad received permission to build new freight power only if it served the national interest. The result was the rise of the 2104, massive, uncompromising engines designed to move war freight across mountains and prairies with relentless force. The Chesapeake and Ohio T1 class, built in batches from 1942 to 1948, and the Pennsylvania Railroad J1 class, delivered between 1942 and 1944, owed their existence to these government controls. To conserve critical materials, both classes adopted proven, simplified designs. No boosters, no experimental features, just raw, tractive effort and reliability. Railway Age reported in 1943 that such engines were prioritized for moving coal, steel, and munitions, often running double or triple shifts with little downtime. Yet even as these machines hauled record tonnage, the seeds of their obsolescence were already sown. Within a decade, the same economic logic that justified their birth, efficiency, resource allocation, and cost would see them retired early, outpaced by diesels that promised lower maintenance and greater flexibility. The war had demanded muscle, but peace demanded something else entirely. Streamlined passenger engines once promised a future shaped by style as much as speed. The New Haven I-5 Hudsons, introduced in 1937, wore sweeping stainless steel shrouds and pulled express trains between Boston and New York, their Art Deco lines capturing the optimism of the era. On the Milwaukee Road, the Class A Atlantics and F-7 Hudsons carried the Hiawathas across the Midwest, clocking over 100 miles per hour with a confidence matched only by their bold orange and maroon paint. These locomotives were the faces of a modern railway, featured in posters and magazine spreads as icons of American progress. Yet behind the glamour, railroad accountants scrutinized every payroll ledger and maintenance bill. By the early 1950s, the Florida East Coast 482 Mountains and the Western Maryland 484 Potomacs were quietly retired. Reliable workhorses whose service lives ended not from failure, but from the relentless arithmetic of diesel economics. In the span of a few years, engines that once defined the cutting edge became surplus, their strength and beauty set aside for a new era of efficiency. The dreams of designers and the pride of crews faded into the background, 
leaving only photographs and scattered memories of a time when style and power seemed inseparable. On a workbench in the 21st century, blueprints from Altoona's test plant meet digital renderings and modern alloys. Here, the Pennsylvania Railroad T1 is getting a second chance. The T1 Trust's volunteers are rebuilding number 5550, drawing on original Baldwin drawings and new CAD analysis to correct the flaws that doomed the originals. Engineers pour over the poppet valve gear, refining the timing and metallurgy to withstand the punishing speeds that once burned out the Franklin system. With 6,550 indicated horsepower proven in the 1940s and a projected mainline run in 2026, the team is determined to tackle the notorious wheel slip that haunted the duplex design. Modern weight distribution models, improved sanders, and electronic slip detection promise a smoother launch. For these builders, every weld and calculation is a stand against extinction a living effort to show what steam could have been and might yet become. Some losses left no second chances. In boardrooms from New York to Savannah, the decision to cut steam was swift and final. Minutes from New York Central executive meetings in 1955 show entire classes, Hudson's and Niagara's, written off for scrap. Their names crossed out in ledger books. The central of Georgia's Big Apple 484 locomotives vanished just as quickly, erased by a line item and a rising scrap price. No museum, no private collector, no last-minute appeal could save them. By the late 1950s, not a single Hudson, Niagara, or Big Apple remained. The silence that followed was absolute. A generation of engineering swept away with no relics left to tell their story. Turbine power swept through the industry with bold promises and short careers. Union Pacific and General Electric's massive gas turbines, the Pennsylvania Railroad's S2 turbine, the Chesapeake and Ohio M1, and Norfolk and Western's John Henry all chased efficiency and horsepower on paper. Yet by 1970, every last turbine was retired. They were outspent, outserviced, and outlasted by the diesel revolution. Today, none of America's most powerful steam giants survives intact. Their stories warn how innovation can outpace its own future. As rail technology races forward, these vanished engines remind us, progress often erases its boldest experiments. What do you think we'll lose next?